what a day. I just, uh, the Jewish Journal is doing a video where they're asking 45 individuals to light a candle in memory of the 45 who died in Maron last week. And so I enter into the series as those of us who are um, moving from cocoon into some sort of new world really with the heaviness, like it was very heavy. I, I didn't want to do it. I was asked two days ago to do it. And it's very heavy to light a yard site candle in memory of someone who was going somewhere to experience ecstasy uh, in honor of the memory of a mystic, you know, the Rashbi in our tradition. And the person who is credited in our mystical tradition, writing one of the most mystical texts, the Zohar, on the merit of this memory, everyone descended to, um, or ascended to Har Maron and had this incredible experience. And in it, they got too close to the fire and 45 souls were lost in a stampede of people who perhaps in their reverie lost some sort of touch, they went too far. And it's a huge tragedy. Children died, young people died. And um, when it happened and since it happened, I think what I wanna share is just uh, what is the connection in the, um, you know, Israel had a, had a really severe lockdown for a while. And what is the connection between perhaps that being the first event where they were with tens of thousands of other people and going into life with such passion that they lost touch of, of what it is to come together as a group again. And that, I use that because I dedicate personally um, tonight and the experience of grief and unresolved grief and the confusion of what it is to be alive at this time and to their memory and um and inviting hope with us to, uh, who knows a lot about this topic and she's going to share her story she's going to share her wisdom and some of her book and the i think the essence of what i'm hoping or what the objective is that we can be vulnerable we can be authentic I shared with someone today how I had lunch for the first time with two friends that I haven't seen in over a year. And it was really weird. I felt really awkward. It was like being in junior high school and having like your first time out with friends on your own and like not quite sure who I was. And I say that because that's another manifestation of grief is not quite feeling like ourselves and even not knowing who we really are. So with that, I um, introduce Hope Edelman, who I think in so many ways, Hope does not even require an introduction. I think you're kind of, um, you're a grief celebrity. Like, <laughs> unfortunately, but from motherless daughters and the impact and movement that that book created um, over two decades ago, through the consistency and constancy of your writing and the way that you offer up for us an incredible way to frame the times we're living in and what loss and enduring loss means and how we can continue to dwell in a life of meaning through the after grief, which is the name of your latest book. So with that, I, I offer it to you to just give an introduction and tell us all. Yes. Sure, and then I'd love to just facilitate a discussion of everyone's experiences. We have a terrific group here today. Thank you so much all for being here. Um, you may know my sister, Michelle Edelman, board president, uh, leader extraordinaire, organizer supreme. Um, I'm the more, the less organized and artsy one. I show up at these events with a list of notes, but really I just like to connect with people and talk about the subject. And I'm thrilled to be asked to talk about this. I mean, I'm not thrilled about the circumstances, of course, but I'm grateful, I should say, that Rabbi Lori recognizes and Zach the importance of the subject and has invited all of us into this space together for an hour to um, share our thoughts about it. So I'll just start very briefly by uh, explaining what the after grief is, because Lori mentioned it first, um, and um, tell you the story of how this book came about. This is what it looks like. That's a copy of my newest book, came out in October. It'll come out in paperback next spring. The after grief is the period that I've identified that begins when we start emerging from the cocoon that we retreat into when we've had a, a major loss. Um, and this book is mainly about loss to death. Um, and it's mainly about adults who experienced loss more than two years ago. 
um, because two years is typically the outer limit of grief services that in communities provide or nonprofits provide. But as any of you who've lost someone you love at any time in your life know, it's not like you wake up on you know the, um, the, the, the two year and one day period and you no longer feel sad or, or longing for that person. It, it extends for the rest of your life. So I think of the after grief as the period that begins when we start emerging from that acute phase of grief. Um, and it's gonna be different for everyone. It might come for you after six months. It might not come for two years. It might come after six weeks. It depends on so many factors when you, when you um, emerge from it. But um, so it starts at that point and then extends for the rest of our lives. And grief becomes cyclical, not linear. It can be reactivated at different times of the year, on holidays, on anniversaries, um, for many different reasons. But there wasn't much written about this. My first book, Motherless Daughters, was written in the 1990s. And that came about because I was 17 when my mother died. Michelle was 14, our mother, I should say. Michelle was 14, our brother was nine, almost 10. Our mother was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 41, quite late in the game there. And she died 16 months later at the age of 42 which seemed really old to me when I was 17. You know, I, was, I remember being 17 thinking, oh, my mom, she got married. She went to college, she got married, she had children. All of these milestone events that still seemed so distant to me made 42 seem kind of ancient. But my relationship to that, you know, those set of facts, which means my, meaning my mother died of breast cancer at the age of 42, um, my relationship to those facts changed a lot over time. Um, they changed when I had my first child and I could see the world through the eyes of a mother and could really imagine what it might have been like for my mom to have to leave her kids. It changed again when I was 41 and 42 and realized how incredibly young she was. And it's changed now as I look back, you know, more than a decade older than she got to be. So I wanted to write The After Grief because there was no real model for long-term bereavement, what grief is going to look like and how it's going to show up for us 10 years, 20 years, 30 years after a loss. This July will be 40 years since my mother died. This is the 40th anniversary of her death this year. And I can still tear up about thinking about what she lost or missed out on or what we didn't get as children as a result of losing our mom I was also really curious about how our stories change because I would tell the story or I have told the story of my mother's death really differently at different points in my life. And that's because, like I said, my relationship to those facts has changed. Um, but what I really have come to believe, I learned this when I was writing Motherless Daughters, which was my first book about early mother loss um, for women who had lost mothers when they were children, teenagers or adults is that there are some things, particularly there are losses, big losses that can't be gotten over. There's this message in society, haven't you gotten over it yet? I don't even know what that means. Like what is, 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 is my relationship with my mom like a hurdle that I'm supposed to jump over and, and run past? And no, um, some things can't be gotten over or let go of or put down. They can only be carried forward with us. And that's, how I feel I have carried the deaths of both of my parents and this past year, which for many of us has included multiple losses. Um, just in this past year, I've been going through an unexpected separation and divorce. My youngest left for college and we're selling the family house of 24 years. And I just think, wow, that feels like a real pileup of losses. And yet, I still feel like one of the fortunate ones because nobody close to me died of COVID. And I think what a messed up year we've had where I can say that, where anyone you know, can say that. And where so many people, so many people will say, I did lose a loved one or two or four to COVID. Um, this, this once in a lifetime event that came on so quickly and took so much from us so fast. So there are some things that can't be gotten over and can only be carried, but I want to emphasize that we're not passive actors in this process. Um, we, the losses may have been out of our control, but how we choose to carry them forward is very much within our control. It's very much 
a choice. And that's something that took me decades to learn. So I wrote a book hoping that it will save other people a lot of time because um, there is a field called post-traumatic growth, which I write about in the after grief, which is how quite a lot of people are able to either with assistance or on their own, turn tragedy and suffering and trauma into personal growth and goodness for the world at large. And I feel like that is a mission that is a choice that we, we can alchemize that pain and our suffering and whatever we've lost during the past year into something good for the future, whether it's just good for us or good for those we know and love or good for the greater society. I always think big like Rabbi Lori. So I'm always thinking maximum impact. How can we change the world? Well, the world might be a little too big. Okay, how can we change Venice? Or how can we change California? Or you know, how can we create a movement that is sustainable? But um, all of us have the power within us to do that. And um, so I just wanna say a few words about this year that we've been through, and then maybe we can just have an open discussion. I'd love to do that if that's okay with you, Lori and Zach. But I, I wanna just acknowledge that with any change, there is loss. We leave something behind typically when we change. And even if we're making a good change, like, you know, my daughter went to college this year and it wasn't exactly the freshman year that she was expecting or hoping for, but nonetheless, it was a change. It was positive. She was excited, but she was leaving things behind. She was leaving the opportunity to see her boyfriend every day. She was leaving, you know, the, the, the family unit or me in the house. And when there's loss, when there's change, there's loss. And when there's loss, there needs to be adjustment to living in a world without the things maybe that were familiar, even if we want to let go of them. And if that change is unwanted or unanticipated, that adjustment is harder and it's likely to take longer. And right now, what we are experiencing is a, um, a year where we had experienced perhaps a lot of loss and adjusted in that cocoon that, that Rabbi Lori talked about and emerging from the cocoon is a metamorphosis. It's a, it's a, it is in fact a metamorphosis. You know, we always think about the butterfly when we think about metamorphosis and emergence. But I wanna introduce you to a different metamorphosis, which is the one of the dragonfly, which is the icon of, of my work and the company that I've started to help adults who were bereaved as children. The dragonfly's metamor, I didn't even know I was gonna talk about this. It's not in my notes, but I think it's actually a metaphor worth considering. Yeah. <laughs> um, the dragonfly's metamorphosis is called incomplete. It's an incomplete metamorphosis. And I think dragonflies have really bad PR because incomplete sounds in negative and it's not it just means that it's a three-stage metamorphosis instead of the butterfly which has four stages the butterfly goes from the egg to the caterpillar to the cocoon and and, and then the butterfly um, and in the inside the cocoon it disintegrates literally into a goop of dna and reconstitutes as the butterfly dragonflies is different the dragonfly has a three-stage metamorphosis it goes from egg to larva to dragonfly but listen to how extraordinary this is. So the egg hatches and a little larva comes out and it lives in the water for most of its life, the dragonfly larva. It kind of looks like a cross between a cricket and a potato bug. And every, you know, so often it climbs up on or out of the water onto a reed and it molts, it sheds its skin and a slightly larger larva or nymph it's called emerges and then it can grow only to a certain point in that exoskeleton and they have to climb the reed and molt again and shed its skin and that's how the, the nymph grows. And it, it can do this 15, 16, 17 times. And I think about that tiny little nymph brain and how the first time it molts, it must be like, wow, that's cool. And then by the fifth time, it's sort of like is in the rhythm of doing it. And by the 10th time, maybe it's like ho-hum. And by the 15th or 16th time, it's just probably rote. But then the 17th time, the dragonfly nymph climbs the reed and the back of its neck cracks open and a fully formed dragonfly comes tumbling out. And then it waits 
well, it comes halfway out and it waits for its abdomen to harden. And then it comes all the way out and it waits a little longer for its wings to dry. And then it takes what is called its maiden flight. And it's kind of shaky and they only go a couple of meters at first, but then they gain their strength and then they fly. They don't live a whole lot longer as dragonflies. But I think about that little nymph brain and when that dragonfly comes tumbling out, does the nymph know that the dragonfly was in there all along? Or is it just this extraordinary moment where they think, wow, I didn't know I could do that. And then they fly. And how amazing that might feel to that little nymph. And I'm thinking of our emergence from the COVID year in those terms that we have choice about what our maiden flight is going to be and that there may be things inside us that have developed over this past Molly, year. I just took you out. That we're, <laughs> that we're not even aware of. And, um, you know, we're re-entering a world and the, it's, it's, it, it may feel messy and that's okay. We all locked down at the same time together with the same set of rules. And most of us, you know, followed these rules and they were pretty prescriptive and descriptive, but, the emergence is happening in a staggered fashion because people are getting vaccinated at different times and it's happening different county by county, state by state. And the rules are a little unclear. So we're all kind of like finding our way. And the world that we are re-entering, it resembles, but it isn't exactly the same as the world we exited 14 months ago, right? Everyone's wearing masks. People are social distancing. We're not going to go back to work probably the same way we, we were working before right away, if ever. Um, a lot of us have had to move house or down, you know, downscale in certain ways. Um, and, you know, I was doing a call the other day. Um, I do support group calls online. Every Tuesday, I have a call just for motherless daughters. It's a community call where they can find support and, and solidarity and help each other, it's intergenerational. And one of the women was saying that she feels like re-entering or emerging into the world after COVID is like returning to school after her mom died. She said, because the environment was pretty much the same, but she had changed so much. And maybe some of you who've experienced a death know that, that you know, after a Shiva period, especially, you re-enter the world and everyone else is walking around like everything's normal and you just want to scream and say nothing feels normal because you have changed so much. And that's a bit what it may feel like, you know, coming out that we've changed each one of us individually and collectively as a culture in this past year. So you can walk down the street in, in Venice and I mean, the buildings are the same, right? The traffic lights operate the same. Yeah, well, there's businesses that are gone, right? But you know the traffic lights are still going from red to yellow to green. There are still cars on the street. You know those kinds of things are the same, um, but we are maybe experiencing them differently because we have changed during that time. But again, I really believe we get to choose what we're going to carry forward on our maiden flight. Now you know as we molt the seventeenth time, like what did we find or discover in the past year? that we want to carry forward in that maiden flight, bearing in mind that that maiden flight may be you know, a little wobbly at first while we're gaining our, our, our wing strength, but what do we want to carry forward? And to give you an example, I always, I have always had like an enormous social network and that shrank a lot. Do not recommend going, I do not recommend going through a divorce when you can't see your friends because that was, that, that really, I, I learned a lot from that. A lot of strength, a lot of growth. But I did have a small pod of about four or five girlfriends. And I was surprised by who showed up in that pod, like who really shows up. I don't believe it's true when people say you learn who your friends are when you go through a crisis. I know who my friends are. I've known who my friends are for decades. What I learned was which of those friends can really show up for me at a time of crisis when they are going through various crises themselves and who I can show up for at times of crisis too. But I had a pot of about four or five girlfriends who I continued to see during the lockdown because we all committed to just, you know, really limiting our social interactions and being very, very careful and meeting outside. And those four or five friendships deepened so much. I've never, it's been a long time since I've had 
girlfriends like that. And I want to hold on to those friendships. I want to carry those on my maiden flight. You know, those women are so special to me. And so in my heart now, whereas two of them were really just kind of like more than acquaintances, but less than close friends. So I just invite you to think about that as you re re enter, re enter or emerge, emerge from the cocoon and re enter this world that has. The world has changed, but so has we. The pandemic and bubble. What do we want to carry forward? Yeah, the pandemic bubble. So the, cocoon. the cocoon. That's the new, like, buzzword. Cocoon? Whatever. I've only heard Rabbi Lori use it, but I like it, so I've been using it now. But yeah, it kind of is, you know, we're kind of insulated in some ways and protected and self-protected. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I hear a lot of people saying they're nervous, you know, about coming out and interacting socially again. Like they feel like their social skills have atrophied in some ways. Yeah. I've always been weird. Now I feel weirder than ever. <laughs> so really? <I'm> saying, <laughs> I just say to people, I'm just owning my weirdness. I feel awkward. This is weird. It's just weird. And I also love hugging people, but there's like this, you know, the, the, the yardstick of intimacy is just kind of like, you know, perhaps like seven yardsticks long and there's just, it's, it's such a time, but I, I wanted to point out in the chat thread that I, I wrote the question that you had asked so beautifully, what did we find and want to carry forward from this past year as we begin our maiden flight? Like that's just, that's such a beautiful um, offering and contemplative moment. And I want to invite everyone to think about that and what did we discover about ourselves and moving the conversation right now into a little bit of a crosstalk where we can say, what was this self-discovery? If anything, we live in this tremendous privilege as our community goes. I've done several COVID funerals, unfortunately, as Lori Lacara remembers, she's here from Hillside Mortuary and um, they were weird. And there were many members of our community who lost parents and weren't able to have the touch and the say goodbye. They weren't able to bury their fathers and mothers. Um, when they did, and they did have the privilege of burying their fathers and mothers, they did it alone. And I have to say, I think that's one of the saddest things I've ever seen is going to a cemetery and, and watching a young man alone dig his mother's grave and fill it. And I just give these images because it was such a year. I don't even know how to make sense of it. And I wanted to just invite us into think what did we find and want to carry forward? I offer my, my humanity. You know, one of, one of the things I show, this is my COVID. This is my COVID truth. I lost my hair during um, COVID when I was sick and when it's growing back, it's starting to grow back, it's growing back gray. And I was like, ooh, I like that. But I say, <laughs> it's my authenticity is what I think I, I came, even like my, my screen. I keep it like this, you know, look at, look, look at Hope and look at Rabbi Lori, <laughs> Rabbi Lori right? So I, I think um, my authenticity and, and flaws uh, and the truth of who I am is what I really reclaimed. Like there's no more keeping up with anything. There's just being me. And I, I, I want to just model yeah. that for anyone. If anyone wants to add it in the chat or just unmute yourself and, and share, we're really here to give our holy offerings. Um, and then in the end, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll bring it back. And when we think about what we want to, what we, what we want to carry with us moving forward, it also may, you know, inspire us to think about what we want to leave behind, right? Some things that this year maybe inspired us to drop or, or leave behind or let go of. I'm spending weekends in Ojai now, Lori, you know, where Maya, where I'm, I'm Maya's my daughter, sorry, where Michelle and Amy are. And so I'm up there. I rented a furnished studio for weekends just for myself. And I find myself now that, you know, we're starting to open up and go out a little bit more. Just, you know, in Ojai, people are very friendly. You make eye contact. They just say hello. It's like the Midwest. People say hello. And I say, hi, I'm Hope. I'm new here. Do you live here? And I'm like, who is this person? Like to, to myself, like, who are you? Who are you? Um, because I wouldn't do that in LA, but I realized one of the things I'm gonna leave behind this year, I hope is self-consciousness, you know? Um, because I spent so much time alone, like we all did this past year. And I realized what a people person I am and that I'm just not gonna be self-conscious. I'm just gonna extend myself more. That's what I want to carry forward, leave behind self-consciousness, carry forward, just, you know, um, extending myself to people. I've met some really amazing people that way.
Ah, this is good. What Barbara says here in the chat box. I discovered so much of my busyness was distraction from presence. Things have slowed down and it's easier to be. But now that things are opening up, I'm feeling a fuzziness about how to spend my time. Barbara, is that because you are now being exposed to distractions again? Would you like to come on and talk with us a little bit? Hi. Um, not necessarily. It's it's kind of more of trying to figure out what's okay, what's not okay to do. Like before, when things were shut down, I didn't have to make decisions. It was like done, right? And now it's like, I mean, I am, I'm going to Washington DC to see my son who I haven't seen in 17 months in June. You know, I've made that commitment, um, but it's this still like, should I do this? Should I do this? And so I find that my presence is now distracted by those decisions of, should I do this? Should I not do this? Should I? And, and it's not clear. It's not like tomorrow, the pandemic is over and boom, open up. So it's this fuzziness that I find is distracting me. Does that make sense? Because it's like, I don't know if I should do this. I don't know if I, I am, but I don't, you know, it's like that kind of is right. distracting okay. me now. I, I mean, I think we're in a liminal space now, right? This space of liminality. Is there a word for this in Hebrew? Is there anything that you're aware of in, in the teachings, Lori, that guides us through this time? Havdalah. It's Havdalah. I mean, Muriel also, if you want to lend some language to it, but I think Havdalah is the, is the liminal space of leaving the container of Shabbat and Shibut, this idea of like deep restfulness or just stasis and then moving into the week that's to come next. So we really are in this Havdalah experience of separation. And the reason why our, our ritual for Havdalah is, is a multi-wicked candle is we need a reminder as we go through a liminal space that our light should increase as we leave this, this, this very tender crescent pause. So something needs to impel us, you know, compel us, propel us forward, because the 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 stasis or the or the menucha, the 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 restfulness that we experience is 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 regenerative, but it's also like the container. I I always experience Shabbat is like a demi death, like it's a container of just pure being, and so the ritual that propels us forward is a firestorm. And I feel very much so that there is some parallel right now to this liminal space we're in and, and that we need, this is why we did Cocoon, this, this part of the butterfly series, so that we could have rituals that honor that what we're going through right now is, is not a return to normalcy. It's just the next experience of, mm -hmm. of, um, of quarantine and COVID times. Because the truth is none of us knows what happens next. Nope. We have no idea. We're in a changed world. And this is, I think, why rituals are so important, though, because rituals um, bind the past, the present, and the future. That's mm -hmm. the purpose of ritual, right? And, and it creates a continuity across time. And one of the things that COVID has done, I think, is it has disrupted our sense of continuity across time. And it has asked us to live very much in the present. We've had to let go of the ways of certain ways of the past. We don't know which ones of them are going to return to be carried into the future. I mean, ask commercial realtors. They're the first ones to tell you that you know, they don't even know if they're going to have jobs in the future in the same way. Um, a lot of jobs have been lost, right? And of course, a lot of lives. We don't know what from the past will be extended into the future before we had a reasonable expectation that whatever we had today and yesterday would still be here tomorrow. But there's an uncertainty around that now. But rituals bind the past, present, and future. You, you can do something in memory of, a, of an event or a person or a relationship in the present and with the intention of continuing to do it in the future and passing it on to future generations. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm thinking when you talked about um, a multi-wicked candle, like if we were to create, if we were to think of this period now, you know, this cocoon and emergence as a Havdalah, right? 
what rituals might be meaningful to perform during this time that we could carry forward? And I think I'm going to look in my house for a multi-wicked candle and and burn that, you know, in my in my kitchen um, weekly or daily, or you know, just in 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 the spirit of the Havdalah period, mm -hmm. and acknowledging that you know that's what I'm in, and then maybe tell my kids about it so that when they experience liminal spaces, also because we all. Ex you know, experience states of liminality from time to time that maybe that's a ritual that we might continue in our family. What do you think, Lori? Like what would be good? Well, one of the things that I was gonna offer at the end of the session, and I'll offer it now because you're asking is we have the, the observance of Shavuot coming and it's like May 16th, 17th, 18th, but inside of Israel, it's just one night. And what I wanted to offer the community is after the full 24 hour observance at the end of it, as the sun is setting, if we could, come together after we have some sort of reflective process of what was this revelation that we were seeking, we have the ritual of Yizkor, and this is where it lends itself to what you front loaded us with, which is the journey of grief, because the Jewish technology of prayer is brilliant. Like Jews and Lori Lakora, who's here, Jews do death really well. We've been doing it for a long time. We, we got it down. Yeah. Um, I, I had like an incredible moment during COVID where I did a funeral and the clothing of the of the deceased um, disappeared. Uh, Lori, I don't know if you know about the clothing that that disappeared at at Hillside. Um, yeah, so clothing disappeared, and oh my um, god! And I'm not going to mention the name of who it was, but in in the end, the family abruptly decided then to problem solve it by burying their father in a shroud. And so they they then went so far as to say, let's give him the ritual burial. Um, uh, that is given to a traditional observant Jew. And so he was given um, the cleansing and he was buried in the shroud and they, they put stones on his eyes. And I, we, we did a coffin viewing and we saw it. And um, what the family didn't know is before I had found that out, I did a lot of research on his lineage and he was from quite a profoundly um, uh, respected, that's really a euphemism for this family, like a huge rabbinic lineage this guy came from. Like we're talking, if I said the names, you'd all go, whoa, but he was the Alicia Benabuya of his family. He kind of gave it up and became a lawyer and was a justice buyer. And, and so at the end of his life, the person who was buried in the coffin was the righteous man who reclaimed Judaism uh, through his seeking of justice in the secular world, which is a very Jewish thing, right? Mm -hmm. I, I give you the poetics of this man's story because um, we do we do death so well. We just do it so well, you know. Tahara, this 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 ritual of cleansing the body and 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 restoring dignity to the dead. That's that's how we bury the dead as Jews, and to have people like hold the body like a child being cleansed, like. Right. It's just intimate and lovely. Um, so with Shavuot coming up, um, I'm hoping that we could gather together at my favorite place, which is just south of the Venice Pier on the Monday, which marks the end of Israel's observance of Shavuot and perform a Yisker service, a Yisker service seeking revelation, seeking separation and make it a Havdalah because we would, if we were in Israel, be performing Havdalah at that moment. Um, so that's what I offer for that Monday night for us to consider a Havdalah that evening as a Yisker observance on the beach with the sun setting, being present, being outside, being with one another, getting out of our Zoom rooms and saying, okay, I can do this. I can remember. I see Muriel unmuted. I'd love to hear from you. Yeah. Um, Will I, you introduce yourself first? Because you're uh, just, wow. Yes, I'm Muriel Vance <laughs> and I'm uh, trained as a Jewish chaplain and currently the executive director of a rabbinical court for conversion. Uh, and I believe that uh, we do death very well. And I was going to say, I lost my mother when I was 17 and she was 40. And my sister is on this call because she was 14 when my mother died. Um, and it was Yisker that gave me what healing I have achieved. Because five times a year, I'm called to remember her. And you're right, it changes over time. Um, and to carry her memory forward in some way, as I was able to name my only daughter after her. Um, so I, I was thinking of Yisker as the saying goodbye part mm. of, you call it Jewish technology. 
but it's uh, very powerful. And I love your idea, uh, Rabbi Lori. And Yiska stands to me as a way, a, um, a culturally or religiously sanctioned way to continue honoring our parents, to continue, you know, upholding that commandment. I did a, a lot of research on um, the cultural relativity of grief to write this last book. And, and I looked at a lot of cultures and how they handle grief. And you're right, Lord, Judaism, um, for those who do perform the rituals, um, gives a framework and acknowledges, oh, this isn't something that's over, you know, in a, in a month or a year. This is something ongoing. We're going to light a candle every year on the anniversary of the death. We're not just going to do it for the first two or three years. We're going to do it every year. You can say, Yiska, at any time, you know, moving forward, it doesn't have to be just within the first year of the death. But, you know, the framework of Shiva also, as let's think of Shiva as a liminal space as well. That's what it's intended to be. It is, is a place for the mourners to, cat, to pause, to honor the profundity of what they have just experienced, to separate from the world, to receive support, and then to go back in. So we're just having like a really extended shiva right now, the entire country. You're just reminding me, I was, I was remembering someone today, a beautiful man whose name I will, I will say, um, uh, Scott Wexler. Wexler. Um, he, he died about 13 years ago, I think it's going to be. And uh, from diagnosis to death, it was two weeks. And so I sat with him a lot in, in the hospital. And at one point, and some of you might have heard me say the story because it, I feel like it was the moment where I really received the essence of life. He lay in his deathbed. He, he taught Shakespeare to junior high school students. So he was truly um, a righteous man. And he lay in his bed. And um, at one point he opened his eyes and he said, why is this happening to me? And as you know, Muriel, you don't just say something you sit there. And so I mirrored and said, why do you think it's happening to you? And he rises from, he was half paralyzed. He, he rose from his bed. And he said, I think this is happening to me because life is about learning to receive love and give it back. And he falls back into his bed. And I had this moment, it was liminal space. I was just given this truth, like that's all it's about. And I never connected it with Shiva before, but I think uh, the way I, I liken it to is that as children, we come into this world and we're so vulnerable and we receive, we're given all of these things were given nurturance and being held and, and food and we receive. That's how we're taught is just to receive, but something happens in life. There's a switch and we feel like we have to give. And a lot of our culture is about us not being good enough, us being unworthy. And I think that's a bit of what's being triggered as we're coming out again, is that there is this societal guilt or this kind of like near death experience that we all had. And it's like, well, who am I? I think people with privilege especially are, are struggling and trying to check that privilege in some way. And so as we live in this culture where we are told you don't give enough, like give more, now give more, what Shiva does is it resets the pace and says, just receive. Just be still and receive. And then we, we're kind of nurtured again in the wisdom of life. And I think perhaps one of the things that happened during the COVID is that we were in this extended shiva. You know, we were just able to like sit, which is what you do when you have shiva. I mean, it's like you sit shiva, like that's the idea for seven days, you just sit. And um, they're homonyms, right? Shiva and, and, and yeshev, they have a, a homonym bilateral root. Not really, they're different different shorshas, but, but they sound the same, right? So you just kind of sit and receive and when I think of what we're going through, how, when I think of Barbara, what you said is, is that the, the, the switch is like, well, I've been giving all these choices to produce and to show up again. And I was just in this wonderful place of receiving. And I just want to honor that we were able to receive and, and, and the most mystical tradition of Judaism, the Kabbalah is, is it literally means the receiving. So there's something really mystical about receiving. Even when we look at like a sperm going into, into an egg, it's receiving, you know, it's, 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 the, it's, it's the container of life, like your dragonfly. So what I would like to think is this fecundity is leading to some sort of true birth, that there was a fertilization process that went on. And now again, the cocoon and the breaking out or the, or the nymph the, to the larva, to the, to the wings. Right. Um, but how do we bring in the mentality of receiving as we're asked to 
produce and launch again. I think one way we do that is by framing or reframing, because when we think of receiving, we often think of ourselves as um, passive recipients. But oftentimes what I've discovered is that, especially in this past year, especially, is that by reaching out to for support and, and receiving it is a gift to the people who want to give, <laughs> right? And so that sometimes receiving is also an opportunity to welcome giving into the world, right? And we can also think of, well, there's so many opportunities now and so many you know, um, tasks that I can perform. Instead of feeling overwhelmed, maybe we can think I'm going to learn how to be discriminating. I'm going to, I'm going to exercise my powers of discrimination and be really judicious about what I choose. And um, instead of saying yes to everything or feeling that I, I need to do too much, I'm going to really discriminate and, and choose carefully and remember that I have agency, you know, to exercise our, exercise our agency. And to do that, oftentimes, you know, I, I believe in my life, you know, on behalf of the less privileged and, and the underprivileged, how can, how can I use my agency in that way as well, not just for myself and those I know. With that, I, I want to open up that the conversation I had today where I shared this story with someone was with um, Chris Montgomery, he and his mother. For those of us who are um, having the full Butterfly Series, the Butterfly Series started on Passover. And Passover, um, I purposefully brought us through an experience of caterpillar, cocoon, and butterfly. Um, we started going through it's a Seder walk. And as we walked through Venice, I wanted us to really in the beginning, walk through Venice. So we interacted with leaders of the Black Lives Matter movement at a church. Then we came to the Rexwood Rec Center, the, the Oakwood Rec Center, which had been, which has been used as a um, shelter, a homeless shelter, uh, for the months of January, February, and March, and to a little bit of April. And I had met um, Chris's mother, uh, who was just sitting outside, and I was biking around, and we became friends. And um, Jermaine, uh, we, I asked her to speak at the butterfly series at the beginning of the Seder crawl and she did. And the moment she was speaking, she learned that the shelter was being closed the next day and she would be homeless. Mm. And um, from there, the crawl continued into um, being caterpillars and playing like children crawling on the floor. Um, there was a cocoon experience of a sound bath where we had to wrap ourselves in sheets, cocoon ourselves on the floor and then just absorb the sounds of this gorgeous sound bath as a guided meditation led us through the understanding that we could release all of the negative isotopes, let them fall into the earth, and then um, really find their other negative isotope to create a positive and create fecundity and rejoin our bodies. And when we were ready, we could break out. And when we broke out, um, we had Bittersweet Symphony playing. Bum, 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 bum. It was very cool. Anyway, from there, we went into the Venice Canals and um, there was this beautiful music playing and everyone was given a box. And as the, the music soared, everyone opened the box and two butterflies flew out. And the idea was that we were, we were, we were, it was safe to come to life again. It was safe to connect ourselves with living again. And that's what Passover is about. It's our freedom holiday. So I say all this because Jermaine and Chris, remember I talked about the homeless, we decided that we were going to circle around them. And so we created something called the Open Temple Electric Starfish Project. So a cohort of us decided to circle around Chris and Jermaine that we would not allow them to live on the streets. They had one bad night that was very bad and we got them into a hotel and we kept them there until last week when they finally got keys to an apartment and we moved them in. And today um, I went there with a videographer because we're documenting this. And while we were there, we had a bed um, brought to them. So now they now have a bed sleep in. And um, I was speaking with Chris and he wept. And the reason why he wept is because he said, it's so hard to receive. I've been holding on for so long. It's so hard to receive. So mm. all of this, um, illustrative uh, uh, verbal <laughs> verbiage was to go to your point, Hope, is that that they're, receiving is hard and being able to give is in some ways what we're better and most conditioned to do. And for us to remember that when we are giving, um, that it's awkward for people to receive. And that also is a container of grief because to receive is to let go, right? It's to be vulnerable. It's all the things that come up with grief and bereavement and mourning. And, and mm -hmm. people, you know, we, we've, been, we've been masked for a year, right? We have to, you have to let your masks off. 
So we had a good cry and we're in a different place. So how can we give back? Our, our next two cohorts of electric starfish are starting. And a part of the electric starfish project is that um, the homeless issue is, is really an issue of those of us who have homes. That's what I've decided. Uh, it's not about a social agency coming and solving it for me. It's not about my mayor or my governor providing a lot of funds to solve the problem. It's about those of us who have homes, seeing the humanity in those who don't and circling around them and helping them get home again. And so um, we're, we're, con we're creating our second and third cohort. Um, we have some candidates that we're gonna circle around. And the idea is, uh, the goal is to have a hundred cohorts and allowing us each to like get 200 people off the street every year. And so it's a new, um, I'm, I'm looking to hire a coordinator. We're doing some development around it and we're just gonna work this. We have a really great uh, group of people here in Venice who are, who are houseless at the time, but we don't, wanna, we don't wanna create houses, we wanna create homes. And so if anyone wants to give back, let us know and message us and become a part of the Electric Starfish Project. Oh, look at that. So Zach, will you um, introduce what Hope is up to? That's really great. I hope, I think you should introduce it. It's, it's a really, really great offering that you're extending to the world. Oh, thank you. For Mother's yes. Day. Every year on the day before Mother's Day around the world, motherless daughters groups have gathered in person to hold luncheons or teas to honor mothers who are no longer living. And um, well, last year, all the luncheons were canceled on short notice. And this year, the groups were, you know, concerned because they felt like we don't want to go two years without a luncheon. Women look, wait for this every year. They look forward to it. It's a ritual. It's a ritual that they created. It's been going on since 1996 in some cities. It's 25 years. And we realized it's the 25th anniversary. We're all on Zoom. God help us. And um, let's bring all the groups together this year for the first international day of remembrance. So um, we are opening it up to everyone. It's a free service. Anyone can come. It's donation based, um, but we've got lots of women coming for free. So there are more than 800 women signed up right now, 28 countries. <laughs> yeah, I'm freaking out a little bit. But, um, <laughs> just, a, just a little bit. Um, it's 90 minutes. We've got some fantastic speakers. We have really generous donors who are doing giveaways. And we're gonna do a toast to all of our moms. And then we're doing the first worldwide circle of remembrance where we say our names and our mother's names out loud together to uh, sim symbolize the enduring connection that exists even after their death. So yes, thank you for putting that link in the um, chat box. Everyone's welcome to attend. It's gonna be quite something. We have women coming, oh my Lord, Hong Kong, South Africa, Russia, India, the UK, um, Denmark joined today. Um, yesterday, I think the Netherlands came on board. It's just, it's, it's extraordinary every day. It's, it's a new country. Um, and it, we're creating a, a, an international sisterhood now. So yeah, please pass the word on to anyone you know too. We're gonna have a lot of women there who are spending the first Mother's Day without their moms. And this carves out a space for them on that weekend where they and their moms have a place. I saw Shanna Katz ask, do you have local events in San Diego or Los Angeles? Um, we do have events in Los Angeles. Uh, well, we did um, before COVID. I was running retreats in Los Angeles for both early mother loss and adult mother loss. And there was a lunch, there's been a luncheon every year until last year, um, every year in person in Westwood since 1996 and they'll start up again next year. I, I imagine 2022 is when we'll come back in person. Do you say Shana or Shana? Shana. Shana, hi Shana. Do you, hi. Uh, do you can you share your mom's name? Um, no, I, well, she's not, she's not passed, but um, she's alive. <laughs> she's Roxanne Katz and uh, her mother is also still alive, um, Rose Schindler, but I think like, it's just good to have for the future even, even though they're still here. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for asking. So beautiful. I'm, I'm just wanting to open it up. I'm really curious about the experience of loss during COVID times. Uh, is there any way that we can just use um, a tool like the raising of hands um, and seeing how many of us uh, during COVID had a loss? I'm just really, really curious about it. 
uh, just on the bottom reaction, you can uh, you can say yes. You could do a yes if there was a loss during this time, or a thumb a thumbs up for a cent. Mm -hmm. um, I see one. I see two. I see three. I see four. I see five. I see six. So there were there was a good number of us. Um, Robin Shane. Hi, Robin. Are you there? I'm. I'm wondering who who was in who in your life um, parted during this time. Uh, you're muted. Could you unmute? Thanks. Yeah. Sorry. Um, my mom passed away in December, and I and my grandfather passed away in August. Wow. Wow. Were you able to be with them? I was able to be with my mom. Uh, I she was at Cedars, and they let us in, and we were able to be with her as she passed. Um, I was not able to be with my grandfather and I was not able to uh, attend his funeral either. I attended via Facebook Live and my dad went alone and it was just very difficult sitting with my mom in our living room, watching it, not being able there to hold him, be with him. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry for that. It was really confusing. Um, were you able to memorialize him or have any sort of yet like um, Shiva minion online or? Memorial? Uh, not really. Um, it was it was too difficult. Um, he was in Chicago, so my dad flew out to handle all that and was there. And he sat Shiva alone, basically, in Chicago. <clears throat> and then um, here in LA with my mom, we did have Shiva. We did a virtual and then outdoors, um, social distance in uh, our yard for a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. What was his name? His name was uh, Mark Klitsky, and my mom was Arlene Milrad. Okay, so go on with her. Thank you. I, I think Elise might have a question. Yeah. Elise, do you want to unmute? You raised your hand. Oh, no, I don't have one. Thanks. Oh, okay. All good. Oh, was that Lisey? I think that was Lisey Teller. That's me. <laughs> Hi, Hi Lisey. We're sisters in laws. Hey, sweet Lisey. Yeah, it was. Um, I know um, Lisey lost her uncle. Uh, we buried him at Hillside. And again, it was during August and it was um, during like the, the peak of restrictions. Uh, so having the limitations of the funeral and, and um, you know, it was the, I think it was the first one I did. It was a COVID funeral as well. And so I, I just want to share some of the awkwardness is he had to come over state lines and it just took forever. And so his children were in this Benenu because of COVID, they had to bury him in something specific that he was wearing and um, they couldn't open the coffin. So things couldn't be put in like a Talit or anything. And I just think of all of those who died and I'm wondering, Flori Lacara, are, are you still here or did you have to move on? Is Lori still, Lori is still I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. So, Lori, I'm just wondering, like we at one point had spoken about something for the unresolved grief of death. So Lori, will you introduce where you work and what you do just a little bit? Sure. I'm Lori Lacar. I'm the marketing and community outreach manager at Hillside Memorial Park. So um, besides the advertising and marketing and branding, we also provide education programs for adults, for Hebrew Union College second year rabbinic students, and also for the grade school students that are typically in fifth, sixth grade. Um, and just really trying to have people understand um, having that important conversation and what is really necessary to make clear to your family and to your loved ones prior because of what can really happen um, if three children are left to know what they think mom or dad wanted and then there's a clash. Um, and so that is uh, something that we work on, on trying to just really kind of make death a part of regular language and understanding, take away the fear so that we can provide an education and information behind mm -hmm. it. And real quick, Lori, I do have on my agenda to talk to Raphael now that we're opening back up to see if there's any way we can do the big um, uh, Kavir vote this year because yeah. I know how important that is. Yeah, well, I, I also want to, you know, I really want to talk about doing um, Kol Nidre uh, this year uh, at, at, the, at the cemetery. So just know those of us who are into open temple observances, I wanted to invite because of the massive container of grief and all that 
that Yom Kippur represents to have a ritual around it this year, actually at Hillside, where we can invite those who have moved from the beyond in what I say is our, in many ways, Dios de los Muertes. It is our day of the death, which is Yom Kippur, the day of atonement as we prepare for death. So I wanted us to have that experience this past year, but we couldn't work it out because of COVID restrictions, but this might be the year. 5782, man. It's going to nice. be crazy. <laughs> so, <laughs> maybe we'll, yeah, how excited is a rabbi about doing Yom Kippur at a cemetery? I'm like, well, yes. So, <laughs> as I said at the beginning, I'm weird. I'm weird. I'm a little weird. It's okay. It makes no, me- your excitement is contagious. <laughs> I was just telling Robin, I'm like, oh, maybe this is the year we can work with Lori and Zach. Like, we were so excited and we Would love you amazing. both and Open Temple. So, yes, we're yeah. huge fans and we're going to do, do what we can do. I, I, I can't imagine why it wouldn't work this year. Yeah. Yeah. So perhaps that would be wonderful. And just really honoring that, um, that the, the loss, what I was also hoping is that there could be some sort of post COVID, um, experience for people who who were not able to bury their dead or be present. If there could be a service that's done, I don't know if you've done that yet at Hillside. Um, no, but I'm your gal. I can, I can get you in. Um, yeah, yeah we that, can absolutely I, do that. Even, even if it's done on Zoom or if it's done, I would love to do it live and just to do a service where people could memorialize. We were one of the first services in there a few weeks ago and back in the chapel mm-hmm. and we had over 120 people that going outside even. It was a big, it was a big group. It was like the first week you opened. Was that Sinai? Maybe? Nope. Not Sinai? Nope. That was Hillside? Maybe it wasn't 120, but it was maybe it was 100. Oh. There were a lot of people there. Wow. It was quite full. Wow. I won't say um, that again, but it was quite full. Yeah. yeah. And we can do that. We can also live stream for people that aren't able to join us, but to do yeah. live and live stream. And I think by next week, we'll be at like 65% capacity. Okay. Um, so yeah, well, let's definitely do what you want to do. I, I don't think there's any reason we can't put this well, together. This yeah. Year. Because this, this, this conversation continues again, none, none of us know what the future holds. And mm-hmm. um, I, I really believe that in some ways our, it's a horrible image, but like the eyes are circumcised, like the blinders were taken off. I think it's so funny that our masks cover our mouths and our eyes were forced to see and be seen. Mm-hmm. And there's something about asking us to talk less and see more mm-hmm. that has happened through this time and mm-hmm. to hold that close and to be considerate of it as we begin to walk about the cabin, safely or not, I don't know. Um, but I with see- that... Yeah. With that thought, you're able to now lower your mask and have the words come out to match what you're seeing. So it's kind of a beautiful symmetry with that. It's beautiful. And I also wanted to honor Lori right before COVID happened. You had told me about the loss of your brother. Can you bring his name forward? I did. His name is Hank Etas. Okay. Um, and I have to say he passed on October 21st and his birthday was April 11th. Um, and with Robin's help, we were able to do a really beautiful memorial. Um, she helped me to do it on Zoom with friends and family, and we put together a beautiful montage. And there was something that just shifted um, with my grief by being able to have that closure. And and I don't even know if it's closure or just being able to give him what he deserved mm. in being honored. Um, so it is so, so important. So important. So I'm wondering if in closing, I hope we can have a few words from you and then perhaps close with all of us rising and, and sharing with one another the, the Kaddish, the mourner's Kaddish. Sure, that would be lovely. Um, I've been interviewed a lot about how mourning practices and um, bereavement practices have changed during the COVID era. Lori, I'm thrilled to hear that you're coming back to in-person gatherings for services. Oh, we never closed. Because it's so important. <laughs> Well, it's so important for the village to come together to mourn the passing of one of its own. That is a social aspect of grief that's critically important. But I do hope that Zooming and live streaming can continue because it allows the larger village that can't travel on short notice or can't get time off of work or can't find childcare to still be part of um, the, the, you know, the, the commemoration and the memorialization of someone that they loved. And so I hope funerals moving forward will be a hybrid so that that can continue. That may be one of the few good things that comes out of this, this dreadful past year that, that we can expand that village virtually um, so that more and more people can take part in the social aspect of bereavement. Beautiful, beautiful. I saw some 
beautiful um, sharings with that. And I, I do love how you're bringing the technology. I think of all the funerals that people say, I just couldn't make it. And now we can have a way of reaching people um, no matter where they are in the world, which is such an important Jewish value. Um, I just wanna honor that, um, you know, Vanessa Poster shared that she had a physically distanced funeral at Hollywood Forever with Zoom attendance. Um, and that was one of her losses through this time. Vanessa also um, offered that she has a writing ritual and working with people and the, the, the Hope Edelman coined phrase after grief to write and rewrite their stories as they change over time. I know, I hope you also do some workshops um, with after grief. Mm. So there's, there's so much, I really want to have this rich community continue. Um, we're going to be transitioning into Kaddish, but as we do so, I remind us first Kaddish is not a dirge, it's an exaltation of life and whatever God concept there might, there might be that sustains us. It, 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 it takes the Shafal Ruach, the lowly soul and it, it, it elevates it up and reminds us that there are ways and practices to rise ourselves up again through times of loss. Um, someone said Kaddish isn't healing. And I'm so, um, I'm so, uh, so curious about what that is. Um, could, I, I, I'm just, I wanna hear Sharon, I wanna talk with you after this. Um, Zach asked me directly if I want to promote the final installment about social impact. So we are going to um, move through the series to Butterfly. I'm going to have us go through Kaddish um, and then afterwards, or no, I'll tell you now. So um, we have a, a board member in the community. She's actually the reason why Open Temple exists. Um, I got a phone call in 2008 from a woman who knew me. I've been fabulously fired from a synagogue. And she said, they fired you. You're supposed to bar mitzvah my children. And so um, she hired me to, to, to come to her house and do a home cater, which turned into like five kids, which turned to seven to kids, which turns to a lawyer father saying, if I make you a nonprofit, every check we write to you is tax deductible. And that's how Hope and Temple got born. So Open Temple started in this, this woman, Denise Berger's home. Anyway, a few years later, I asked her back onto the board and um, she's on our board now. And Denise's story, as you'll hear, is on September 11th, 2001. She went to work at the World Trade Center at Ion Insurance and um, the other tower was hit. And uh, she turned to her secretary and said, I'm pregnant. And they heard a voice saying, please stay where you are. And the rest of the story she's gonna share um, of how she emerged from the ashes of that day to then become a leader in social entrepreneurship and corporate responsibility. And that's what she does now. So the idea of for us to take flight is to really say, we're in another cycle of grief. Here we are 20 years later after 9-11 and how are we making sense as Americans? Because here we are with another national trauma. How do we truly take flight again? There was an incredible restoration in America after 9-11 and I'm really hoping that we can find that that momentum and that coalescence again, because the spirit in New York was just incredible. And I think that we're needing such a healing in our society and civilization these days. So may we find it and may we move from strength to strength. And that is the next one. And what's the date, Zach? Um, you're on mute. I'm uh, It's the first Friday of June. Okay, great. That's wonderful. All right, friends. So with that, I would I would love to. And Denise is here. Denise, I don't know if I told the story totally correctly, but you'll tell it. And I love you. And I'm sorry if I butchered it. That's how I remember it. And you'll have to tell your story much better than I can. Um, I'm in awe of you. And uh, I love that you're here. Oh, I love that you're here. Uh, she's extraordinary. And you guys will get to get a piece of her. Um, with that, I want to just honor Kaddish and, um, and say that it's a thing. You know, if someone wrote it isn't healing and... For some people it's not. I know that um, I wasn't allowed to say Kaddish for my father because I didn't know he died. And then when I found out I was a rabbi uh, who lived in exile of saying proper Kaddish. Um, and then I went to something called the Hoffman Institute and they surprised me in a ritual where they started playing Kaddish. And we were all like blindfolded in a room and I rose up and this fury came out of me and screamed Kaddish at the top of my lungs. And it was a catharsis like nothing I've ever had. And then after it was over, one of the practitioners said to the entire room, um, we're going to take a moment out to re-say Kaddish because it was disrupted by that one person. Because <laughs> it was pretty fierce. So um, I just share with you, Kaddish is, it's complex guys. It's also an Aramaic because it was meant to be said in the colloquial of its time, which is like completely, um, antediluvian for us today because Aramaic is a mouthful and it has many endings to its to its uh, conjugation. So let's give it a try and let's like crack our teeth on some Kaddish. And uh, if you could do so comfortably, please rise. 
and please lend the names of those that we are seeing Kaddish for. Nel Schneid. Anyone else? Oh, thank you, Tess. Rolf Schuster. Mark Klitsky, Arlene Milrad. Sophia Poster. Abby Fiala. Roger Selbert. Rolf Farfell. Arnold Vermillion. Geraldine Lumion. Jesse Goldring Abramson. Jesse Abramson Goldring. Ira Goldring. Gedal via Kadash Shemera Ba, the Alma Divrach Yurte, the Amlich Malkute, the Chayachon of Yomechon, Chay de Kolbek Israel, Bagala of Isman Kari Vimru Amen. Yehe Shemera Ba Mevarach Leolam Ome Almaya, Yit Barach Vish Tabach, Yit Paar, Yit Raman, Yit Nasay, Yit Hadar, Yit Halay, Yit Halal, Shemay de Kudashabrihu. Le Ela min kolber chata vashirata, tush be chata venechemata, damiran bialma vimru amen. Yehesh lama rabba min shemaya vechaim, alenu veal kol Israel, vimru amen, o se shalom vimrumav, hu ya a se shalom, alenu veal kol Israel, veal kol yoshve tevel, vimru amen. Thank you, dear friends. Hope Edelman, you always blow me away. Thank you, Laura. You always blow me away. You're really, you're really cool. You're really, Michelle's really cool. Really lucky to have a cool big sister like you. <laughs> I'm lucky to have a cool little sister like her. Yeah, yeah, you guys are great. Thank you so much for being a part of this um, cocoon that we created with one another. And um, just so many blessings and so much gratitude. And thank you. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, may we move out of this cocoon with strength. Um, may we break free. May we move into the bittersweet symphony of life once again. And may we find community through these times. Now and always, our temple is always open. So much love to you. Thank you, friends. <laughs>